uh, tonight, our talk is focused on key aspects of the climate change emergency. The UK Climate Change Act, Act sets out a roadmap to nearly zero carbon by 2050. And it's generally agreed that we need to reduce our carbon emissions by 50% by 2030. The Oxford City Council aims to do better. One aspect of this is that around 50% of the UK's CO2 emissions come from the construction and use of buildings. And the UK's legally binding climate change targets will not be met without the near complete elimination of greenhouse gas emissions from UK buildings. This is where our speaker tonight comes in. Tonight, we are extremely pleased to welcome Ian Pritchett as our speaker. Ian is Managing Director of Green Core Construction, a local company which is dedicated to accelerating the global transition to low carbon living with the mission to scale up the delivery of low carbon homes until they can no longer be ignored by the mainstream house builder. Ian is an acknowledged expert in the field of traditional low, engine building material, low energy building materials. Ian has pioneered the use of lime mortars and lime hemp, supplying lime products, technical input, or acting as a contractor to hundreds of new building projects, including the new Channel Tunnel Rail Link Terminal at St. Pancras Station, Chelsea Royal Hospital, the Adnams Brewery Distribution Center, Marks and Spencer store at Cheshire Oaks, the Science Museum Archive, hundreds of houses and numerous schools and other non-domestic buildings. Ian's commitment to the view that traditional materials have an important role in the future of mainstream construction led Ian to forming and running companies dedicated to promoting the use of traditional lime mortars in the new build market as an ecological alternative to cement. In 2013, Ian set up Abingdon-based Green Core Construction Limited, and Ian is the managing director. Green Core is pioneering low and zero carbon houses using its own building system, a closed panel timber frame system insulated with lime hemp and natural fiber insulation. Green Core has been scaling up the delivery of eco housing by partnering with investors to develop medium sized sites. The latest project is at Springfield Meadows near Abingdon, and it will be the first residential scheme to deliver a zero carbon footprint, net zero energy in use, and one planet living all in the same project. As I'm sure Ian will explain, the technology and knowledge to create high quality, low carbon resilient homes exists, but current policies and standards are failing to drive either the scale or the pace of change needed. We need to show others that it is viable to build near zero carbon homes. A question to ponder during Ian's presentation will be, can Green Corps' approach be scaled up? I'll shortly invite Ian to make his presentation, but first I should explain that following the presentation, there will be a Q&A session. In the course of the presentation, could you please submit your written questions using the chat system? At the end of the presentation, Chris Church will moderate the Q&A session and will call on participants to pose their questions. To get the best experience from the session, we also recommend that you turn on speaker view rather than gallery view in your settings. And finally, Please note that we will be recording the session so that we can upload to our website afterwards. And with that, I'd like to invite Ian to give his presentation. Over to you, Ian. Thank you very much. Uh, this is one of the very first Zoom presentations I've done, so I hope everything goes well. I'm going to share screens now, and hopefully you can all see that. If anybody can't, use the chat function. So thank you very much to Ian for the introduction um, to begin with. So as you know, I'm Ian Pritchett. I'm the Managing Director of Green Core Construction. So I'd like to start by explaining why I'm here. And I'm here because we at Green Core believe that we need to act quickly in order to mitigate the worst effects of climate change. We want to set an example for others to follow. And if not us, who? We would love somebody else to step up, but at the moment there are very few people who seem to be stepping up to the challenge. And if not now, when? This is an immediate problem. And we need your help. 
and I will explain how you can get involved at the end of the presentation and obviously we can discuss that during questions as well. I hope some of you have seen this video. It's available on YouTube. Um, you may have had the link shared to you as part of uh, signing up for this webinar. It's called Our Planet, Our Business, and it's produced by the same team that have done Blue Planet and the Planet Earth series. And it's a 30 minute video and it really makes the case very, very strongly for the explaining the damage that we've done to the planet so far. And just as you get to the point that you're really depressed about it all, it also starts to highlight some of the problems and how business can work to solve these problems. And as David Attenborough says early on in the, the program, what we do in the next 10 years will profoundly impact the next few thousand. And that is really, really important. Um, we've got this legislation here in the UK that Ian referred to, the Climate Change Act, and actually it's some of the strongest environmental legislation in the world and it takes us to a target of nearly zero carbon by 2050. But what it doesn't do is, is really weight the pace of that strongly enough to the front end. I think it's, it's generally understood that the Western world really needs to be getting to zero carbon by 2035 and the whole world to zero carbon by 2030, by, by 2050, sorry. Um, which means really we've got to be halving our CO2 emissions by 2030. So the next decade is absolutely critical and we mustn't be distracted by things like the current COVID crisis. We've got 10 years to sort out the mess that we've created. So at Green Call, we believe that business really needs to take a lead on tackling climate change. Government and legislation has a part to play, but business really needs to take the lead and you do see some businesses are really stepping up to the challenge now. You might have seen Microsoft, for example, saying that uh, they're not only going to be zero carbon, they're going to reabsorb all the CO2 ever emitted since they started their business. And so we need to be setting ourselves these challenging targets and targets that stretch us. Even if we fail to hit them, it's important to have them. And we really do need to act now. So GreenCore, the company that uh, I work for, was set up by Martin Pike and myself back in 2013. And Martin is a very experienced businessman, director, and has a background in non-construction areas where he has specialized in risk management, strategy, and performance. My background is very, very singular. It's all been in construction. So about 33 years now in construction. And actually, I sort of fell into construction by accident. I did a degree in physics at Durham University in the early 1980s, and I found myself working on building sites during the university holidays to pay off overdrafts and uh, save up for going back for the next term, that sort of thing. And I was young, fit, strong, and uh, liked manual labor. And I thought building was far more fun than physics. So instead of becoming a physicist, I became a builder. And I was fortunate that most of the buildings I started working on in the late 1980s were pre-1900. And they were built in different ways to modern buildings. They had solid walls. They were built with lime mortar rather than cement mortar. They had handmade bricks. The plasters were soft lime and hair plasters. And to be able to work on these buildings, I needed to learn about these materials and learn pretty fast. And I'm glad to say that I didn't ruin too many buildings before I started to learn. And by about 1990, my business was beginning to grow, but it was specializing exclusively in historic buildings. And we found that we didn't actually need to learn too much to be ahead of the mainstream. And so we started to get great projects from the National Trust and English Heritage. And the more we did, the more we learned, the better projects we got. And then in the late 1990s, we started getting involved in windmills and water mills. And this is really where I started to look at the weather because you couldn't work on windmills if the wind was too high and you couldn't work on water mills if, uh, if there were floods. And so, from about 2000 onwards, we were studying the weather very, very carefully. And I think pre 
2000, I'd been a bit of a climate change skeptic. Um, I thought it was all a, uh, a bit of nonsense and hype. But as I started to look at the weather and see that we were experiencing more extreme weather events, we had floods in 2000 that everybody said were one in a hundred year events. And then the following year we had the same again. And I started to notice that we were seeing more extreme events happening more frequently. And as a scientist, you can't ignore the data. And I started to appreciate that climate change was real. And that also led me to believe that some of the things that we were doing in the historic building world had a place in new build. Some of the materials we were using were low energy, they were unprocessed, they were local, and they were inherently sustainable. They lasted hundreds of years. And so that really set me on the course to sustainable building. And because we learnt about and knew about lime mortars, plasters and renders and things, we occasionally got asked to get involved with eco building. And this is a rather grainy picture, I'm afraid, but this is a straw bale building that we got involved in supplying and rendering uh, with a lime render in the Brecon Beacons in about 1995. And looking back on it, I think this was probably the first straw bale house to be built in the UK. And I was fortunate enough to work on it. So that was one of my early introductions to eco building. And it took another few years before it all started to sink in. But by the early 2000s, I was beginning to ask serious questions about why aren't we using things like lime mortar in new buildings. And I realized that people in the historic building sector who had the knowledge weren't really taken very seriously in the, in the new build sector. So we set up a new company called Lime Technology and the idea was to present a very professional modern face to the use of lime mortar in, in modern buildings. And we were very fortunate that one of the first projects we won was the supply of lime mortar to St Pancras Station, which was being rebuilt, repaired and redeveloped as part of the Channel Tunnel Rail Link project. And it was a fabulous building. We supplied a thousand tons of mortar. It won lots of awards and that was a great catalyst for other buildings to be built out of lime mortar. Um, you can see here a selection of buildings. We did lots of schools, universities, offices, some houses. Uh, the one in the bottom right hand corner here is the, the University Club uh, in Oxford. And the one in the bottom left hand corner is the sports pavilion at Radley College. So some of these were local buildings as well as um, some of them being all over the country. And as the, the uh, uptake of lime mortar started to increase, so we started to look at other things that we could uh, do with lime from an ecological building point of view. And I came across an architect in Suffolk called Ralph Carpenter who'd been pioneering the use of lime and hemp. And we thought, what a great material. I wonder if we could commercialize that in the same way that we were beginning to commercialize the lime mortars. And so we started building new houses out of this material, lime and hemp. We called it hempcrete. And we built a number of prototype houses. The, universe, um, the building research establishment asked us to build a test building there. And then the government set up the Department of Energy and Climate Change and started to offer grants to people using natural bio-based materials for, uh, for affordable housing. And here's some of the affordable houses that were built as a result of that uh, grant incentive. They offered £20,000 a house to housing associations if they would use bio-based materials. We also did a number of interesting private houses ranging from uh, very large grand stone faced hemp houses on the left here to quite contemporary modern curvy buildings on the right. And we did about 50 non domestic buildings ranging from the one on the left here is the Heritage Skills Centre at Lincoln Castle and the one on the right here is the the Wales Institute of Sustainable Education, which is at the Centre for Alternative Technology. So over a period of about um, six, six to eight years, we, we built a few hundred hemp houses and, um, and also 50 non-domestic buildings. But in 2013, uh, I left Lime Technology and set up Green Core with Martin Pike. 
based on the experience we've had, we'd had, we wanted to focus exclusively on domestic buildings and a lot more locally. And so we've developed our own building system, which is called Beyond. And as Ian mentioned in the introduction, it's what's called a closed panel timber frame system. And it's insulated with hemp and lime and natural fiber insulation. We set up our own factory, which is an off-site factory. That means we make all the panels of these buildings in a factory before we deliver them to site. And it's an old aircraft hangar, uh, just the other side of Weekly. We've built up a team of people in our design office, and we reckon we've got a combined experience of about 90 years of, of passive house design and construction within the team now. So uh, we're well placed to control the whole process from design, planning, and manufacture, and site construction work as well. And during that time, since 2013, we've built 44 houses, all sorts of shapes, sizes, locations, um, and we're currently doing 25 in this project at Springfield Meadows, which we think is the greenest scheme in the UK. We'd love to be proved wrong, and we don't say it's the greenest because we want to stand out and be arrogant. We want to encourage other people to uh, enter into a dialogue and let us know what they're doing and tell us if they're doing similar or better things. So back to climate change. Um, you all remember the Paris summit where the world committed to keeping our global temperature rise to a maximum of 2 degrees C and preferably 1.5 degrees C. Well, the latest IPPC report says that if we're going to stick to that target of 1.5 degrees C rise, then we've got to halve our emissions by 2030. Again, it's back to this next decade being critical because we've already seen a one degree rise compared to pre-industrial levels. And we're seeing the consequences of that one degree rise. You remember last year, we had the hottest day ever recorded in the UK up in Cambridge. In Australia, they had these horrendous bushfires. And just as they started getting on top of that, they had enormous uh, flash floods and heavy rain and things. And if you look at the temperatures in Australia, you can see why. This is the average yearly temperature going back to 1910. And the last two years have been well above the average. We don't at the moment know whether these are a blip or whether this is the new norm. But um, these are the sort of temperatures that we might expect to see in the future if uh, climate change continues and global temperatures increase. So looking at what happened in Australia over the winter months, our winter months, gives us an insight of what we might see in the future if we don't tackle climate change. Again, Ian mentioned this figure, around 50% of the UK's CO2 emissions come from either the construction or use of buildings. So that's construction of new buildings, the energy we use in our new buildings, but it's also the energy that we use in our existing buildings. So this is domestic, commercial and industrial as well. So the construction sector has the opportunity to make one of the biggest positive impacts on climate change by getting this figure down. So we've got to move quickly. We've got to do better than the Climate Change Act target of zero carbon by 2050. From our point of view in the construction sector, we think that embodied carbon is the elephant in the room. If you're not familiar with it, embodied carbon is the amount of carbon emissions that comes from the production of all the materials that go into a building the processing, the mining, the quarrying, the firing, the transportation, the, the site construction, everything that results in CO2 emissions in the construction of a building. And an average new house is responsible for somewhere between 50 and 60 tonnes of CO2 emissions at the construction stage. So when we talk about the carbon footprint, that's its embodied carbon and it's pretty high for a house. And then when a new house is built, an average new house in, in an average use will emit around five tons of CO2 per year. So if we're building a new house today in 2020, it will be responsible for 200 tons of CO2 emissions by 2050. So that's not a good place to be if we're trying to get to zero by 2050, 
if our new houses are still contributing to the, to the problem. And the other problem here is that when most people are talking about zero carbon, what they really mean is zero carbon in use. So they're referring to its operational emissions, the fact that they've got its use down to zero or close to zero, but they're not dealing with the embodied carbon. And we think we've got to tackle both the embodied carbon and the operational carbon. The other thing to bear in mind is when we see all these targets and figures and climate models, they're all based to some greater or lesser extent on having carbon capture and storage technologies. So these models that talk about 1.5 to 2 degrees rise in global temperatures have got built into them carbon capture and storage models and the technology for carbon and cap carbon capture and storage doesn't yet exist at scale or at uh, economic prices. So again, another elephant in the room here. But fortunately, nature has the answer. Bio-based materials capture CO2 and they lock it up. So all plants absorb carbon dioxide and then they use the chlorophyll in their leaves through a process of photosynthesis to turn that into cellulose. And if you work your way through the maths and the chemistry, the great news is that it actually takes 1.8 kilos of CO2 to make a kilo of cellulose. And that's because the plant breaks down the carbon dioxide molecule, the oxygen is given back to the atmosphere, that's how we can all breathe, and the carbon is what gets locked up to form uh, cellulose. So we've got this natural carbon capture and storage capability with a natural multiplication factor. And that's really important to us. We also use hemp because hemp is a really fast growing plant. Trees absorb CO2 very effectively and young trees in particular, it's a bit like young people. Young people eat a lot more than older people. Young trees absorb a lot more CO2 than older trees. So if we can start to grow a lot more trees and use those trees for uses such as building, and then plant more trees. It's a natural way of capturing carbon and then locking it up. Um, when you think about hemp, a lot of people will probably think it's a bit of a hippie thing. Um, if you can see me on screen, you can see I haven't really got the hair to be a hippie. I've never really been a hippie. Um, when we're talking about hemp, we're talking about a serious industrial crop that is grown at scale and processed as an industrial raw material. It's been used in the automotive industry for the last 20 years and some people say that hemp is one of the future wonder materials. Actually it used to be the basis of the world economy before crude oil was discovered and allegedly there are 25,000 different uses for hemp. Everything from ropes, canvas, paper, oil, all sorts of things you can do with hemp. So the likes of BMW and Mercedes have been using hemp and if they can use hemp, then we can use hemp in construction. Also trees. There was a report that came out last year that said if we could plant a trillion trees, we could capture enough CO2 to deal with the, the climate change, change crisis in one hit. Even Donald Trump has signed up to the campaign to deliver a trillion trees. And it sounds like an awfully big number. It is an incredibly big number. But last year, Ethiopia as a country planted 350 million trees in a single day. So if they can do it in Ethiopia, we can be doing it as well. There are, there's enough land worldwide to plant a trillion trees without encroaching on building land or agricultural land. So all of this brings me to the conclusion that we are beginning to enter the age of wood. And here we've got an article from the New Scientist last year that talks about all sorts of things being built out of wood from skyscrapers to cars to planes to batteries, lasers. Wood and wood-based products can be used for an awful lot of things or plant-based products generally. Here's a design of a skyscraper that's uh, going to be built in Chicago. We've got our own skyscraper that's planned for London called the Oakwood Tower, but we're already building timber buildings at high rise in London. This is, um, I think, at Elephant and Castle, and it's what's called cross-laminated timber. So it's thick sheets of, of timber that have been laminated in different directions to make them structurally good. 
So this, you can do the, the same sort of things with cross laminated timber that you can do with concrete panels, but it's just far more environmentally friendly. It's got better insulation, it locks up carbon. At Greencore, we've been building our houses out of timber and hemp and natural insulation since we started. And it's all from the work that I've been pioneering over the last 20 years through Lime Technology before Greencore. So the fact that we build these houses out of natural materials doesn't mean they've all got to look the same. They can all look very different, but it does inform the palette of materials that we use and point towards a certain language of architecture. So our purpose, as, um, as I think Ian mentioned, is to accelerate the global transition to low carbon living. Our mission, as we've described it, is to scale up the delivery of low carbon homes until they're no longer ignored by the mainstream house builders. How many we've got to build, we're not quite sure, but I'll come back to targets in a minute. And our vision is to lead by example to change the construction industry forever. So some pretty ambitious targets here, but we can do it because we control the design, we control the construction. And the more bio-based materials we incorporate into buildings, the more carbon we lock up. It's as simple as that. So the, cha the choices that we make when we design a building and when we construct it, determine all sorts of things. They determine its carbon footprint, its performance, but also its aesthetics as well. And we control all of that. So we can use more bio-based materials. And if we do things correctly, we can build houses that have got zero carbon footprints and zero emissions in use as well. And we've been doing this over the last seven years, gradually scaling up from single houses to small groups to a project here at Longcott, which is uh, near Farringdon. And we started this two years ago and we've just finished it. It's 15 houses for a client called Oxford Advanced Living who are basically a group of investors who share our vision and bought the site and commissioned us to design and build it. So we've got 15 houses there. All of them have got a near zero carbon footprint or maybe a zero carbon footprint. We haven't actually audited this one. They're all delivering passive house performance and they've all been built within the one planet framework and it's been the project as a whole has been awarded one planet living national leadership status one planet living in case you're not familiar with it is a vision of the world where everybody enjoys happy healthy lives within the limits of the planet the problem is that we are all living outside the limits of our of the planet um, it, we're all consuming more and more resources and emitting more and more carbon. And in about 1971, we crossed the threshold of the point where we were getting beyond what could be achieved with one single planet. If you look at our ecological budget, there are 11.2 billion hectares and 7 billion people. So this divides equally as 1.6 global hectares per person. But if everybody lived as we do in Europe, we'd be using three planets worth of resources and North America is uh, consuming about twice this at the moment and this is only balanced by the fact that we've got a lot of parts of the world that are using less and we're exceeding the resources so we're sort of no longer living off the interest we're consuming and burning through the capital of the planet as well and this can't carry on so we took what we did at the project at Longcott and we said we wanted to go a step further. And so our current project, Springfield Meadows at South, Southmore, is 25 houses, and this time it's for a client called Sassy, Sassy Springfield, and it's another group of investors who share our vision. It's 25 houses, and we're targeting the same zero carbon footprint, passive house thermal performance, but we're also going one step further and saying we want these houses to be net zero energy in use. So what we've done is reduce the amount of energy they use by delivering passive house performance using air source heat pumps. And then we're using photovoltaic panels to generate electricity. And we've calculated how much energy that each house will e use each year. And we've made sure that the PV panels on the roof will generate at least that amount of energy to achieve net zero. 
in the summer they'll generate more than they use and in the winter they'll generate less than they use but across the year it will be an average net zero and then working with uh, bioregional and the one planet living framework we've looked at all sorts of other things we've set up an electric car club and a car sharing scheme we've got a partnership with the barks bucks and oxen wildlife trust who are advising on the wildlife nature and ecology of the site and they're going to monitor it for the next five years and report back to everybody and so this project has been awarded one planet living global leadership status it's also the first project uh, the first private housing project to be funded by triodos bank which uh, we are very very pleased about and we have a formula we call it the secret formula but actually we we don't keep it secret we want to inspire other people to do the same sort of thing so we use bio-based materials to lock up carbon we use passive house performance and that's a series of simple steps so high levels of insulation we design out all the thermal bridges all the things that go through the walls that conduct energy we've got excellent air tightness and that's delivered by the two guys on the right hand side there who are romanian submarine welders now working in the uk construction industry so they're used to making submarines watertight and they've transferred those skills to making buildings airtight we have triple glazed timber windows heat recovery ventilation system and then the whole house is electric so electric heating hot water and cooking and then we've got PVs to generate the electricity and batteries to store it. A lot of people say this isn't financially achievable. Um, we believe that we can build at very similar prices to, uh, to other mainstream builders of the same sort of scale as us and project scale. And we've started to look at where the value chain in building is, everything from land value to the land promotion to get planning consent to the added value of having planning consent, the section 106 costs, the community infrastructure levies, the design, the construction, infrastructure, finance, marketing and, and profit. And these are typical figures uh, across a whole range of projects. But what you actually see is the construction, the thing that affects the thermal performance is only about 40% of what somebody pays for a new house. And most developers when they're trying to save money that's the bit they squeeze so we're trying to turn things on its head and say where can we squeeze money out of other parts of the value chain to ensure that we deliver the right levels of performance and how can we incentivize other people to do so and from a policy point of view the planning department in local authorities sets the community infrastructure levy the SIL and that equates to about £15,000 per new house. So we're trying to lobby local authorities and say, why don't you treat this as a sliding scale, a bit like road fund license. And uh, if you've got an electric car, you don't pay road tax. If you've got a V8 gas guzzler, you pay a lot of road tax. Why don't you have a community infrastructure that's zero or close to zero for passive house and zero carbon houses? and slightly more for ordinary everyday building regs compliant houses and i think if if local authorities did that it would incentivize a lot more developers and builders to deliver zero carbon so here we are based in oxfordshire we are very fortunate to to live and work in oxfordshire because all the local authorities the city council and the county council have all signed up to the one planet living plan with bioregional and Oxfordshire is going to be the first one planet county in the world. So we know that we can build houses that have got a low or zero carbon footprint. We know that we can build them to the passive house standard. So our mission is to make sure all houses are built this way. And we think that one planet Oxfordshire is a great catalyst to, to make this happen. And we want to see Oxfordshire as the center of a transition to a low carbon economy. At the moment, I think about 7% of Oxfordshire's GDP comes from low carbon technologies and businesses, and we could be doing a lot more. Every time we do a project, we learn and we learn uh, quite a lot. We're always on a steep learning curve. And uh, I love this expression where it says, do the best you can until you know better, then when you know better, do better. And we've learned a huge amount over the last few years 
And we started to think about housing in a slightly different way. Everything we've done to date has been about trying to minimize the negative impact on the environment. But we started to think, what if we could actually create a positive impact on the environment? And so we've developed a concept called climate positive. And we intend to build 500 climate positive houses in Oxfordshire over the next five years. And when we say climate positive, we mean instead of trying to get to zero carbon, why don't we build houses that lock up more carbon than they emit? Houses that generate more energy than they use. We can have housing developments where working with a wildlife trust, we can massively increase wildlife and biodiversity. We can bring things like green roofs and green walls into the design and architecture. And if we build enough of these, they can be a catalyst for local food schemes, green transport networks. And we're also working with local community energy schemes, specifically West Mill Solar at the moment, to look at how we can put renewable energy alongside new housing developments to not just deliver new climate positive housing, but make neighboring villages zero energy as well. We're currently planning our first project to make the first zero energy village in the UK, and that's here in Oxfordshire. We also want to build uh, a green business park uh, so that we can attract like-minded people into the area and create a real centre for green and sustainable building. And here are some more buildings that uh, I've been involved in building out of hemp. The one on the left here is for Adnams Brewery. So this was actually the very first hemp building that I got involved in building in this country. And uh, it was a bit like jumping into the deep end of a swimming pool. It's a 50,000 square foot warehouse and distribution center and an office for 120 people. And uh, it's all temperature controlled for storing beer and wine, but there's no heating and cooling in it. It's entirely passive. And the one on the right here is Marks and Spencers at Cheshire Oaks up near Ellesmere Port. And it's the biggest Marks and Spencers store outside Oxford Street. And again, it's built out of hemp panels that we uh, manufactured and uh, assembled on site. And it is the most energy efficient store in Ox in MS's portfolio. It only actually uses 40% of the heating energy that it was predicted to use when it was designed. So here are the ways that I think you can get involved if you're inspired. There are three ways. Do you know a landowner who wants to leave a legacy to be proud of? We're looking for land because most of the good building land in Oxfordshire is controlled by the, the big house builders. And at the moment, they don't have an incentive to do anything different. So we need to find land that's not owned or controlled by the house builders. Um, we're working with a number of landowners who want to see something worthwhile done with their land, but we're always looking for more. Uh, do you know an investor who wants to make a positive social impact as well as a profit? Uh, our projects are only enabled by having investors who share our vision and want to do the right thing. Or maybe you've got the necessary skills, products or services to help and get involved. So these are the three ways that you can get involved. And if you, um, if you think you can help in any way, you can contact us, go to our website and uh, contact me through uh, our inquiries at greencoreconstruction.co.uk. And as it says here, the best way to predict the future is to create it. So I think that's probably just about the time that was allocated to me. I'm going to stop sharing and hope somebody else has got something to say, maybe a question to ask. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Ian. And I hope people can hear me. Um, I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you learned a little. Not least the idea that one of the largest Marks and Spencer's buildings in Britain is made out of hemp which might surprise one or two. I've got a range of questions that have come up and I'm going to take them in order. Right. Slightly, slightly allow someone, the first question was actually received before the talk started, but it is a fairly fundamental important point. So I'm going to invite um, Richard Harding, who was here a minute ago, yeah, Richard. 
Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi. Hi, Richard. So Richard your question, please. Hi, yes. Uh, well, it's two parts, really, but uh, the first part is, I believe you're, that we can build zero carbon houses at a very similar cost to conventional build houses. Mm. So I suppose you've covered this a little bit, but how can we persuade the big builders to, to do this in volume? Uh, yes, very, very good question. It's something I've been pondering on for many years. And I think there are, um, there, there isn't a single answer. I think there are multiple answers. So the, the first thing is to lead by example and show it can be done. Uh, I think it's a bit like learning to drive a car or to learning to fly an aeroplane. It seems incredibly difficult if you don't actually know how to do it. But once you know how to do it and you've learnt and practised, it actually is very straightforward. So doing as many houses as we can to set an example and say, this is how you do it, shows people that it can be done and it's nothing to be frightened of. So that's the, that's the first thing. The second thing I think is in doing that, we've got to try and drive the cost down because when I say we can build for similar costs, we're building to similar costs to other people who are building at the same scale as us at the moment, but, but we're not building at the same costs that the big PLC house builders are building at. They've got massive economies of scale by having incredibly efficient supply chains so we've got to develop those supply chains and and help get the costs down and that only comes by scale but the other thing in the meantime is the carrot and that's things like local authorities taking the plunge and saying let's use community infrastructure as a, a tool to incentivize people because as I say, it's about £15,000 a house on average in Oxfordshire. And the established figures at the moment say that building to the sort of standards that we build to is somewhere between five and £10,000 more per house. So if you could incentivise people through the SIL, I think that would help. And then at national government level, I think just simple things like using stamp duty at the moment, we have a sliding scale of stamp duty, which goes up according to the value of the house. Imagine if there was zero stamp duty on a passive house or a zero carbon house. All the big developers would be clamoring to, to build them but if, if their clients didn't have to pay stamp duty. So I think there's a series of things like that. There may be others, but those are the ones specifically that, that we've focused in on. Okay, thank you very much. I hope you're here. The yep. second question is from Catherine Somerville. And it follows on rather from that. Catherine, would you like to ask your question? Hello. Um, I, I agree with all your points and it's wonderful to hear someone who can put it all into practice. But, but I feel fairly strongly that without the political will and the change in legislation, uh, the major developers are going to be very reluctant to change how they build. Can you think on what we could do to persuade governments to make the required changes? Um, I think in a way it's a little bit the same as, um, as I was saying before, that at the moment my experience is government don't know that it can be done. So they're constantly lobbied by the big house builders who say it can't be done. And so they, they sort of believe the rhetoric at the moment. Back in 2006, um, the government at the time set out a, uh, a plan which was called the Code for Sustainable Homes. There were six levels and we were supposed to achieve level six by October 2016 and that was zero carbon. And the big house builders spent all of their time lobbying government rather than working out how to do it and by 2015, it got scrapped. So at the moment, I think the feeling in government is we need to do it, but it's not actually achievable. And I think it needs concerted efforts from 
um, local authorities, housing associations, investors, people like us operating at the scale that we do to be able to say it is possible, here it is, and we've got to make a lot of noise about it. And then that sort of takes away the excuses. Um, the, the big developers can't say it can't be done if we can show that it can be done. Um, and then I think the legislation will follow. Okay, um, so has the press trumpeted your successes then because they might take notice of some of those aspects? A little bit. We've, we've had quite a lot of good publicity in the last year, although I have to say most of the national publicity has been a little sensational. They've focused in on, on the fact that the more expensive houses at Springfield are you know, around a million pounds. They, they didn't focus in on the fact that um, the cheaper and affordable houses there were being built at the same sort of prices as everything else. So I think there's quite some way to go in terms of getting that message across. And that's why I'm keen to talk to people on webinars like this or, or come and talk to civic societies because we, we really do need that message out there. Okay, thank you. I've got a technical question now from Dan Scharf. Hi, Ian. Hi. Uh, it's very good to hear from you. Um, it's a question of roofs. It's a question of what's a low carbon option for roofs other than thatch, natural state and cedar shingles? Yes, very, very good question. Um, those are certainly uh, three possible solutions. And um, the um, certainly the, the thatch and shingles all lock up carbon. Um, slate is not locking up carbon, but um, it's less processed. But the, these are areas where we've also got to sort of balance it with durability. The other, the other material that uh, is around, I've got um, imitation slates on my house, which are made out of recycled rubber and car tires. And, and so there's a sort of recycling element as well. Um, it, it certainly is possible to, to do things in, in plant-based roofing materials. But at the moment, I feel that's a step too far for um, for trying to persuade the the market and the rest of the industry. Um, I think that would just cross a line with with most builders and developers that we'd be getting into slightly hippie territory at the moment on that. So um, I think it's about finding ways to reduce the energy input into things like. Uh, clay tiles and, and these sorts of things, and natural slates, and uh, and and looking at other opportunities as they come forward. Okay, many thanks. I'm going to go to Peter Holworth now. Peter, you've logged in a couple of times, but I think we can hear you. Would you like to ask your question about extension? Are you there? Okay, I will ask this for you if we can't hear you. The question was, how can you use these materials for extending an existing traditional building rather than just a little new build? Right, um, good, good question again. There's absolutely no reason why you can't use these materials for extension. Um, or, although we we don't tend to focus on extensions because we we have a, a finite amount of time to, to get things done and to, we think we can make more of an impact on new houses than we can on extensions but there's nothing to stop these sorts of materials um, bio-based materials there are other companies out there that uh, that do very similar things to us that are eminently suitable for extensions so Timber frame, wood fibre insulation, and all of those sorts of things are, are great materials for extensions. Okay, I'm going to move to something a little different. Yes. And there's a question from Helen Marshall. Helen? Good evening. Can, uh, thank you for a very interesting presentation, Ian. Um, I was wondering, I mean, I suspect this hasn't applied to you so much so far. Uh, given the scale of development you've done to this point, but I wondered if you had any views on 
housing density if you're looking at larger uh, sizes of development because uh, you know my view uh, I'm talking personally but also from the um, point of view of the ca campaign to protect rural England it, is that our current house builders are generally pretty woeful when it comes to housing density and actually that there would be significant advantages to, to higher density development for all sorts of reasons but you know sustainability a key part of that. Hmm. Yes I think density is very important and uh, I can't say I'm an expert but um, I think with density comes um, a really um, strong need for good design as well. So in, in Oxfordshire at the moment, certainly in the Vale, their local plan talks about a density of 30 units per hectare. Um, the Stirling Prize winning scheme that was done in Norwich at Goldsmith Street was I think 82 units per hectare. And I think that's a great example of how you can do something at a much higher density and still produce a stunning scheme that, that wins the Sterling Prize. Um, but there are a lot of schemes that are badly designed and don't really work at any density. I think the lower the density, the easier it is to get away with bad design. And as you get more dense, you really have to have more dis more. Um, and higher quality design. So, as I say, I'm not really an expert in, in density, but I do think it is an important part. And uh, we're certainly looking at schemes where we can produce really stunning places for people to live at higher densities. Springfield Meadows is, is a bit of an exception. It's a bit of a quirk of planning, but um, it's very low density. It got planning before we acquired the site. And um, it is something like eight units per hectare there. Um, and we would like to have seen higher density, but, um, but the local planners didn't want to see higher density there. So um, I, I suppose what I'm saying is I agree with you. Um, you know, we, we've got a finite amount of land and uh, we can't build sprawling developments over all of it. Henry Fletcher, you had a question. Yes, I wanted to just get your opinion, Ian, having spoken about uh, the new build side of things, on how much of this is relevant to the, uh, the very old housing stock we have in the UK, and, um, and it's relatively, as I understand it, low replacement rate. And, uh, how do we also encourage or should we be encouraging uh, older houses to be knocked down and, and uh, sort of low or positive climate impact buildings to be built in their place? Yes, another great question. Um, some of it is relevant. So um, our existing housing and building stock is of various different types ranging from sort of major historic listed buildings to pretty grotty buildings that have little architectural merit and, uh, and perform very badly. And natural materials can be very um, good at upgrading historic buildings. And so that's one aspect where I think there's an overlap. And a very good friend of mine called Neil May was a great pioneer of uh, sustainable and traditional building materials and set up a center at UCL for um, looking at this sort of thing, moisture in buildings and renovation. And uh, the other thing is, I think one of the arguments for not replacing our existing housing stock or more of it in the past has always been that there was a lot of embodied carbon in it and we were wasting that embodied carbon and we were emitting more embodied carbon by building more houses. I think if we can get to the point where we are locking up more carbon in a new building than we're emitting, then that argument starts to go away and it gets much easier to start looking at replacing some of our poorly performing and uh, low architectural value housing stock. So I think we will see an argument for that more in the future. Okay, 
Okay, thank you. We are starting to run out of time. Henry had one more question, which I will ask for him, which is how can I visit one of your sites? Send, me an, email. send me an email and we can set up a visit. Um, it'll be easier when we're out of lockdown. Okay, I visited and they are really quite inspiring. One of the issues, of course, is about local planning. And Catherine Schock has a question there. Um, the question is, to what extent can you actually train the local planners so that they understand what you're trying to do rather than relying on them to, to come and look at, well, to a great extent, look at your plans without the, the understanding of, of what you can achieve? Yes. Um, I, uh, again, these are all great questions. Um, the planners <coughs> do um, drive me mad. So my interpretation of this is the planners are great people in a great police force. They're just policing the wrong policy at the moment. Um, but planning policy needs to be based more on carbon, energy, and the challenges that we face in the future with climate change, rather than sizes of gardens and uh, parking spaces and, and that sort of thing. So they're, they're policing the wrong things. Unfortunately, national planning policy is going to take a very long time to, to change. So we've got some discussions ongoing with local people like Chris and local planners about producing some supplementary planning guidance that could be adopted more quickly on a local basis. Um, and I think at the moment that's the key to not necessarily educating, but giving local planners the tools to use to support this kind of policy that if they've got supplementary guidance that they can refer to it makes them uh, makes it easier for them to do their job and support these sorts of things so i think over the next year or two we've really got to get some good supplementary guidance out there i've got a couple time for a couple more one of them is from an, an anonymous attendee so i can't ask you to but I will read it out, which is that would it be possible to expand your construction model through local plans and the Oxfordshire 2050 strategic plan? Would it be worth pushing that these plans should set targets for a proportion of such homes on sites above a certain size so that volume builders would have to engage with it? Is yes. that viable? Um, I think it, um, yes, yes, I think it is. And I think that's the sort of thing that we would be looking for. Um, and when we say a proportion, a very high proportion, like 100%. Right, well, that's a pretty clear uh, yes. Yes. Okay, I will just risk of um, butting in. You mentioned the fact that there is talk of developing a supplementary planning document. Um, that work is being led by Oxford Friends of the Earth. Anyone can find that on the Oxford Friends of the Earth website. I won't say more than that because we are coming to an end. We can go on with two or three more questions. But there's one specific one from David Rogers, who in his questions has partly raised the issue of high density and one part of his question is about transport, but the other is coming back to the policy issues. Yes, Ian, I mean, I think you sort of covered it earlier on, but uh, uh, the question is what, to put you on the spot, what single piece of legislation now could bring about the sorts of changes? So effectively, it's to twist the arms of the four major house builders, the Persimmons and so on, mm. to cause them to adopt your standards, because it's got to be legislation. I don't think persuasion is going to work, is it? Um, Quickly enough. No. Um, it could be legislation. Um, I think it probably comes back to the financial incentives I was talking about, such as stamp duty and SIL. Mm -hmm. I think those could be really powerful tools. And if you, if you started to set targets, but with financial incentives for achieving them, I think it, we'd have to have a, a bit like a, a budget every year or two where where these financial incentives were tweaked mm -hmm. so 
a bit like feed-in tariff on on solar panels when it started there was a, a really strong incentive for people to do it and it got phased out over a period of time i think with solar panels there was an in, an argument that it it was phased out too early and too dramatically but um if we started off giving a hundred percent uh relief on sill and stamp duty for passive houses and zero carbon houses or or some sort of way of defining the the sort of types of house that we're talking about and then over a period of time it was it was phased out because clearly we can't get to the point where everybody's doing it and everybody's getting 100 percent relief otherwise there won't be any revenue coming in but um it needs to be enough of an incentive as as early as possible to, to create that behavioral change. Um, so I, I would say those are the, the things that could be done relatively quickly and relatively easily. I've got one other question. I hope it, can we keep it short, Alice and Jenna, about design guides and their role in this? Uh, yes, I, I've listened with great interest to your talk. It's really good. Um, and uh, talking about uh, what's already available within planning, um, I'm a councillor on the Vale of White Horse Council and we've recently had a look at what's possible within our design guides and supplementary planning guides already and it's all there. Um, uh, uh, all the different things like uh, orientation, uh, green roofs, solar roof tiles, uh, position of uh, and location panels, uh, construction materials with low embedded energy, it's all there and the targets are there within government for all houses to be become zero carbon already. So th there's no reason why you shouldn't get this, uh, this sort of uh, development through a, a normal um, planning cycle. Okay. That's great to hear, thank you. Okay, one final question from David Grant, who I can't seem to offer a chance to speak. The question he says is how do the additional costs, if there are costs, compare to save running costs? Um, would, how many years, if someone was buying a zero carbon house, does it take to pay back? I think this sounds a bit like the solar issue. But yeah. the question is, would loans be a good incentive to house buyers for zero carbon homes? Well, I, I think at the moment, um, we're seeing that there aren't necessarily any extra costs in doing this. There are series of different choices when when we build a house there's a there's a massive process of design and specification and there are maybe a thousand different choices that need to be made we just prioritize our choices slightly differently and we prioritize everything that that deals with carbon and and thermal performance and we maybe make some compromises in some other areas but Overall, the, the cost is no, no different or not significantly different to people building any other houses at, at the scale that we're doing it. So I don't think there is a necessarily a, a, a cost penalty to pay. And there is definitely a benefit in saved running costs that at the moment we don't see that coming through with the value of the house. But we might be looking at saving anything from sort of one to three thousand pounds a year in running costs and of course that ha does have a value over time but um there isn't really a way of capturing that value yet okay many thanks i think we've kind of come to the end i would hope that people feel this has been a really interesting evening i thought i knew about a bit about this but i've learned an awful lot and i have to say it's really encouraging to meet someone who, having realised we have to do something about climate change, has actually gone and done it on this kind of scale. And some of you will have seen the news that Oxford City Council are now getting on board and are planning themselves to build zero carbon homes. I hope we're going to see a lot more of this in the near future. It's going to be an interesting few years. And we really have to make sure that as we move into recovery phase from the pandemic, uh, we don't sacrifice environmental standards. But in fact, we really take this as an opportunity to move forward. Thank you very much. I mean, that's the big thing I'm going to say. I'm going to say thank you very much to Ian for 
a presentation which was very informative and uh, very encouraging. As you say, Chris, uh, it's so good to see someone who has uh, an outfit of, uh, of uh, Ian Pritchard's type, which has such ambition based on real achievements. And as Ian said in his presentation, there's nothing like having achievements under your belt to be able to persuade other people that it's possible and they could try it too. And that's, uh, that's excellent. And as you have also said, Chris, uh, COVID-19 economic recovery is, uh, a, a, it could be seen as a bit of a spectre. We don't want these kinds of initiatives to be lost in the rush for economic recovery. And so we have to try that much harder over the next uh, months and uh, year or few years probably to be able to ensure that these kinds of ambitions that Ian has described so well today stay alive and make some real progress. I'd also like to thank the participants today. Thank you so much for joining this, uh, for this uh, webinar. And also thanks to the production team. This is our first webinar and it's gone reasonably well uh, without a hitch. And, and uh, especially it's gone reasonably well because of the quality of the presentation. Thank you so much, Ian. If we could give you a round of applause, we would. Okay. Uh, we've got further Zoom seminars coming up in the next few weeks. Uh, please uh, look at our website if you would like to uh, follow any of others. We're, our next webinar is on inequality in Oxford, another key concern of the Civic Society, and our presenter will be the CEO of uh, Oxford Hub. Once again, Ian, thank you so much. And I look forward to OCS working with you to help you to realise these ambitions, doing what we can. Fantastic. And uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you and good night. And as requested by our Prime Minister, stay alert. Good night.